Um, welcome, Tom, to the Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of Metaorganisms here in Kiel. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure uh, to have you here. You are one of the leading people in the hologenomic symbiosis field. You are director of the Evolutionary Hologenomic Center in Copenhagen. Um, you are also a group leader in, this, in the hologenomic lab at the Globe Institute in Copenhagen. Um, you very well known, many, many papers, many diverse aspects we, of which you're interested in, we come to that. Um, at the beginning, I'm interested in how did you get where you are right now? It seems, I mean, you are, you were, you are interested in how nature functions and animals, and, but you, you're working on birds and on reptiles and on, on ancient DNA and all kind of things. Um, what drove you into that field? Um, yeah, that's a, it's, it's a great idea. I mean, I studied biology at Oxford, which is a, funnily enough, a Bachelor of Arts at Oxford. And uh, during the biology at Oxford, there was actually the thing that struck me the most was evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was the big pictures, things that I found most interesting. I'm not great at details, but the big picture ideas of how things happen. And during my subsequent defil at Oxford, I actually diverged into molecular biology, but I was always driven by what more can be done. And initially I was doing that with methods. What more can we do in the lab? But once I sort of was able to move back to evolutionary biology, my interest always became, what more? What's next? I, I'm very bad at focusing on a particular problem for a long time. I'm always curious about where can we go next, right? So I admire hugely scientists who can study a particular system for a long time and get an incredible depth of knowledge. I'm terrible at doing that. And this is actually what, what fascinates me about you know, the holobiont or the meta-organism and, and in fact your work originally, because for me, it was just opening up a whole new landscape of ideas that, that could be thought about and tested, and some might be right, some might be wrong, but to me, that's what's really fascinating. How far can we push this idea? How can we readdress questions that we thought we'd solved already? I, I love your title, which you give later on in the talk. Uh, you will start the whole conference with the statement, uh, why so many things I thought are, right, are, are definitely wrong. Absolutely, but, but they're almost certainly wrong, right? And I'm not a, afraid to admit it, because I think it's more exciting, actually, with the current answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before we move on, um, what I really would like to get is, is there something in whatever, during your education, in, the, in childhood, in your parents' house, or something which really uh, got you fascinated with nature? Well, I, I, uh, I was fortunate to, to grow up abroad. Most of the time, my, my my parents were living abroad in places like Africa and Asia, so I was, of course, exposed to a diverse ray of nature very early on. And uh, what a lot of people dream about doing today, traveling and seeing the world, I'd done early. So I guess I already had in my mind that, that knowledge of diversity, and it was very logical for me to then go and study biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Today I see you as a major science manager. I mean, you're running center, uh, you are driving uh, Copenhagen Place in, in new directions. And uh, uh, is that difficult, or does that hinder your original uh, way of thinking and working? You know, on on organisms to find out specific questions. Uh, is that uh, is that a challenge? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it has its disadvantages, but overall I think not, because I, I get excited about people that get excited. And if I can get people excited with some of the ideas we have, and if they can take it further, they will do a better job than I. You know, As we probably all know, the, the further we get away from our original training, the less skilled we are at doing these kind of things. So for me, I mean, of course there is a... I love being able to sit and think, uh, and think about the ideas, but... I love more actually discussing ideas with very smart colleagues who've got the tools to address them, right, and seeing what happens. And, you know, I'm quite happy to be told it's a stupid idea. I'm quite happy to be told I'm wrong. But if there are any ideas they want to take further and I can help that happen, to me, that's a huge gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, a, a really important word, which is tools or technologies. If I think on your papers, um, these are all, you know, big data mostly are big data papers um, either going in the past uh, and or, or, or just in, 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 in taxonomy. Um, was technology crucial to get there where you are right now? 
I think technology was crucial for me getting there because I do get fascinated by the technology because it comes back to my interest in what can we do that we couldn't do before. So I'm, if I see new technology, my first thought is, what can I do with this? What can I apply it to to try things in a new way? And you know, a lot of the times it's spectacularly a failure and you get a fancy machine and it doesn't do what it says. But, but I mean, you know, I'm not saying it answers the questions better, but it often gives different insights, more complementary insights. and. And I am very fortunate. I'm based in a Nordic country, and in Nordic countries, we have a lot of foundation money that we can use on equipment and stuff, and so we can do these experiments. And, and you know, it's, it's, to me, that's the beauty of science, trying out things, testing ideas. If you're wrong, you're wrong, but you've learned from that. And, you know, I, I feel extremely grateful that we've never had to really count the pennies you know, based where we are, that we can do this kind of stuff. And it's, a, you know, in many ways, it's an injustice if you look at, you know, what the limitations of different systems right across the world. But, uh, you know, fortunately, we've built up a fairly big hub in Copenhagen. We're a very diverse international hub, and lots of people have come in to try this kind of stuff, and, and it's working. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating place there. Um, still going a little back in the past and your your previous work, um, as you alluded already to, this is highly diverse. I mean, you have nature covers on birds and uh, many different organisms. The um, and you're obviously fascinated by the diversity, um, but is there a common is there a common theme uh, among all these different works? You're working on ancient DNAs and on horse bones and on on plants. It, it doesn't. It, it seems it doesn't really matter what. Um, but so, if you would, you alluded a little bit already to that. But what is the common the red thread? Um, um, yeah. among all these different studies where you are you, you're pushing them and uh, you're bringing them up uh, and then people are doing that deeply um, what's the what's the red thread you know it's often adaptation how do things adapt what are the means to adapt how do you adapt on different time scales how do you adapt when humans are driving an environment versus when we're changing the environment like it's happening right now and you know, that's why we study ancient DNA. When everyone was studying ancient DNA to look at population structure, I was much more interested in what can it tell us about the timeline of evolution? Can we actually see the changes happening through time? And actually, that's my fascination with hologenomics because you know this realization that the microbes are doing so much for the host and not just the obvious things, not just the diet and so on. And they're bringing in an adaptive mechanism and I actually believe it's probably the most important adaptive mechanism on the short term. In the long term, genomes can, can play a role, but if you... If you've got a challenge, for example, of immediately changing the behavior of a wolf into a dog, you can't wait for generations of selection, right? You've got to fix that straight away. If we've got challenges today that the, the environment is changing, the oceans are changing, you know, things are getting drier, temperatures are getting hotter, we can't rely on genetic variation to be selected on and maybe in 30, 50 generations get there. This is where the microbes seem to be the key. And whether that can be used to help natural systems survive or whether we can apply that actually technologically, we can drive it to help things adapt. To me, that's really you know, part of the fixing the future. Yeah, uh, goes back, uh, I think you agree, uh, to the old idea of Eugen Rosenberg's uh, hologenome theory of evolution where he re made that point that the genomes are very stable but the, the, the host genomes are stable. And so, um, so this idea is... Uh, fascinating and absolutely important. Is there proof for that idea? Can you provide proof for that now with novel technologies? Eugen oh, couldn't, and that was the controversy in the field. Um, he brought up, I think it's a brilliant idea, and it's probably true, but uh, to prove it is another thing. Yeah, well, there's always the problem of proving what happened in the past, but we can definitely do experiments that show how rapidly microbiomes can affect things. So, for example, uh, this idea of how do we tame a wolf into a dog, right? And my initial thought is, we know that there are all sorts of genes in the genome of a dog that change its behavior, but there's still this time gap at the beginning. And there's actually, you know, we, we've done experiments. I had, I had a very good couple of PhD students, Lara and Louisa, and they were working on domestication experiments where people have tried to redomesticate things, the famous belly of foxes, for example, or there's a group in Sweden, redomesticating chicken. And you can study these with holoomic approaches and you can actually see what changes are happening at the genome, what changes are happening at the microbiome, even in a controlled situation. And you can start to tie the bits together and show for these behavioral changes to happen, it has to use the microbiome. It's the fastest way of getting there. Whether that explains how we domesticated the wolf, of course, we'll never know. That's the challenge of studying the past, right? But we can definitely show it's compatible with the idea and possibly an alternative that's 
more sensible than the idea that there was genetic variation in the population that could magically be put together very, very quickly to change the behavior rapidly. If you, if you uh, go, go along these lines, if you think of that, you know, microbes are a major driver of evolution adaptation, um, brings you to future ideas. I mean, when we can manipulate the microbes, uh, can we then do something to the host in terms of um, changing environmental conditions? Yeah, well, that's a very, very good question. I, I want to go back to the, you know, I don't know whether microbes are drivers of evolution. They're enablers of evolution, definitely. You know, they're a partner in it, but I wouldn't say they are driving it necessarily. Of course, there are always exceptions where a, a microbe is, is basically shaping the immune system and so on, and it's going around. I absolutely think there is very applied consequence of this, and actually we've been very active in looking at applied consequences now. Mostly we've been active in the, in the, the food production mm -hmm. industry, for example. Um, but for example, consider insect farming. Insect farming is a very realistic option for the future for helping deal with some of the challenges we face with the food waste we have, for example, the, the food conversion efficiency problems of other systems. It's not very attractive to many, many people, but insects raised for feed, for feeding chickens, for f feeding salmon and so on, could be a really great solution. The problem is, if you talk to, for example, the salmon industry now, they're not attracted to insects because they say they're too expensive. And they're too expensive because the amount of feed and the kind of feed they have to give them is too expensive. But if you can actually engineer the microbiomes of the insects or co-engineer the insects and the microbiomes, to work with things that are essentially free and a problem, whether it's waste from the brewing industry or whether it's actually waste from, from farming cattle or so on. And if you can adapt the insects and their microbiomes together to feed on that, you've suddenly reduced the cost of the insect farming. That makes them attractive. It makes them an alternative feed, for example, for, for salmon farming or chicken farming, which then helps you deal with problems such as overfishing of the pelagic fish, plus all the contaminants they bring into the chain and so on. So, so there are very obvious angles like that. And of course, there's huge interest right now in methane production in the rumen, for example, and what can be done by changing the diet and the microbiome and so on. But what I, I'm actually particularly interested in in all this work is, is there a single solution or not? And you know, I, you know, if, if you look around at modern medicine, the, the thing today is personalized medicine yes. based on the realization that genetically we vary, therefore we vary in our response to drugs. And of course, what people tend to forget is microbes are little drug factories <laughs> producing drugs. So I personally think if you accept personalized medicine, you have to accept personalized microbiomics to some degree. And so, you know, this I think will be a very important area to explore in the future. If you make a wonderful probiotic, can you give it to every chicken or does it have to be tailored to certain lines or, and so on? And, and I think there's a huge potential in that area. Yeah, um, I fully agree, um, but makes the whole thing much more complicated. And oh. so the next aspect then is, I mean, you, you can be proud and you are founder of this life sciences and in, in Copenhagen, um, and you brought together an enormous uh, group of people and uh, infrastructure and money and everything is there. Um, what are the challenges? The challenges are the amount of data. There's no doubt. I mean, we're, we're in a situation where we can do large experiments. And in a classic experiment, we can sequence the host genome and the transcriptome and the epigenome and the microbiome and the microbial transcriptome and the metabolome. And then, you know, how does one deal with that much data, right? And, and on, at face value, it seems impossible, right? And, and you, know, you can apply machine learning and black box kind of things and so on. And, and for the record, I'm not a computational biologist. But and so on the one hand, you can sort of lose heart at this. But on the other hand, what we've noticed is some of the signals we get are so strong that it's actually not that hard to work out what's going on. And, and this is what actually has amazed me most of all about the, the holobiont to some degree, again, because I come from animal plant genetics. And it's very common to do GWAS studies, whether it's to look for a basis of disease or a, a trait in an animal you want. And typically you need very large sample sizes and you get very small effect sizes, right? The strange thing for me is that whenever we do experiments on, on animals or even plants and their microbes, even very small sample sizes show very, very strong patterns. Yes. And this is incredible when you come from the other side, right? And so, yes, in theory, it can be very difficult to disentangle it, but we wouldn't be seeing such strong patterns if it was that complicated. So, so overall, I don't think it's that hard. You know, whether we get the exact right thing is another thing. And, and one can argue about many facets of the details. For example, how do you even characterize a microbiome? Is it the taxa or the abundance or the genes or just the functional completeness and, and so on and so on? But the reality is it doesn't seem to be as hard as we're all making it out to be. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's very optimistic. Um, also, 
depends a lot on the people you are working with and uh, all these bioinformatic uh, um, details and requires people and mostly uh, young people mm -hmm. um, which are doing the job and uh, you give the big bold idea and then let them go and find algorithms or something where you can make them something out of that. Um, a question I'm really interested in is what you say to the young if you, there's an early career scientist coming to you and he sees you and uh, you know and Professor Gilbert is a very established person and uh, um, has his fingers in many different projects um, how to get there what does it need yeah well I am a very strong believer in two things the first one is seizing the day Carpe diem. I mean, it sounds corny, but basically you need to take advantage of whatever you can. Nothing should pass by you without you thinking, how can I benefit from that? And secondly, you just need to take the lead, right? I, I think there is a huge problem in PhDs in general, and by PhDs I mean the funding systems, especially in, in Europe, that too many PhDs are prescribed by a grant given to a PI where the project is defined and the PhD student comes in as some kind of babysitter or caretaker, right? When I look at some of the most successful scientists, they're people who from a very early career stage were fortunate enough for some reason to be able to lead their own work, drive it early. And of course, this comes with all sorts of dead ends and so on, right? But the earlier you take the lead, the better. So I'm extremely frustrated by funding systems where, for example, in Denmark, we can apply to the government for grants and we have to write in a PhD student to do the project, mm -hmm. which seems ridiculous. That's training a, a, a well-schooled lab tech, mm -hmm. right? I uh, would much rather see systems where the smartest, the most driven young people can apply for their own funds, they have their independent stipend, they have their own money for the research, can then go and visit PIs and say, how would this fit with you? But they're not at the risk of being told what to do by the PI because they're independent and be given an environment where they can really explore and lead their own stuff. And I do agree, probably the industry doesn't want everyone to be like that. I could imagine if you're at a massive company and all your people in your company are independent, you're not gonna meet your sales goals. But I think there is this critical amount that needs to be there. And I think there is in general too little money because of this idea that the PhD can't be independent, that they have to be told what to do, they're too immature. I find this crazy. So seize the day and take the lead as early as you can. And to be honest, if you're a smart, ambitious young person, find a lab or an institute where you have that ability, where there is a resources available so people are willing to give you freedom, right? And as opposed to chain you to a preset goal. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, even if the system at the German system is very much the same, the, the, the center I'm, I'm running here has the same system. You, as a PI, you write a grant and then you define projects and then you define a PhD position for that project. And so the, 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 the future student is not asked at all what to do. But of course, um, you give them, if a smart people, a smart person comes in the lab, then, you know, the person can develop and get its independence um, to some extent. And I think that is absolutely um, important. And, and That requires PIs to allow that. And that's it, that requires PIs that. to allow that. That's absolutely true. And I mean, you know, the, if you look back in the German history, in the German university system, it's very hierarchical. And uh, yeah, a lot of PIs, I guess, don't want that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they want to be. Yeah, um, being the top. Um, but I think that is a, that's a really, a really important point. Um, coming to the end, I, if you think ahead, you're a you're a you know you're a thinker, you're a visionary person um, who sees um, a bit ahead. Where do you see the field, um, the metaorganism holobiont complexity, which was not exi not aware 20 years ago? I mean, we didn't know. You know, you didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, we just came into that that organisms are multi-organismic. Um, where do you see the field? What what will we have learned in five years or in 10 years? And what is still a real major black box uh, which is hard to dissolve? Yeah, well, firstly, I would like to see it stop existing as a field. I would like it to be so well accepted that it's just a standard toolkit or incorporation into applied and basic sciences. I mean, you know, you're having this wonderful meeting now about metaorganisms, right? I'm holding a conference about hologenomics. Hopefully, very soon, we'll stop needing conferences like that because it will just be a default tool to be used in a standard evolution or an applied conference, right? So, so that requires an acceptance, right? Now, the actual challenges, I mean, I, I think actually the biggest challenge we will often fail is moving from very controlled laboratory experiments through to the real world, right? And I mean, because we know that microbiomes are so affected by the environment that that raises the question of 
once you've shown all these things in a nice controlled lab situation and you take it outside, how applicable is it, right? How measurable is it even, right? And I think, you know, th that's going to be a really big challenge, but it may be that actually some of the signals are so strong that it's not an issue, right? But I, this has been a thing holding it up. I mean, even today, if I, for example, talk about how I think the microbiome is a personalized phenotype based on genetic variation, somebody in the audience will always put their hand up and say, this paper says the genome is irrelevant and the environment is everything, right? And I mean, it's, it's this, this constant dogma, right? And it's true because what they're saying is the environment has a massive effect. But of course, it's ignoring the fact that the genetic variation is conditioning what can happen there, right? Just how height is affected by the environment, but it's conditioned by, by genetic variation, right? So, but, but again, I, so I think there is going to be this challenge of how do we actually fully study it in the natural world where we can't explore all the conditions that are going on. And, you know, that's partly just because environment's very, it's also partly purely ethical. I mean, I would love to study the the microbiome of a killer whale, <laughs> but it's challenging and so on, right? So, so there's a whole load of really interesting ideas that are surfacing now for actual new ways to sample that are, for example, non-lethal, all sorts of like swallowable capsules that can go down and do it and stuff, and the technology will help that. But whether that's still enough to sort of get through the noise created by the environment, and whether the noise is so much that it makes everything else we're talking about rubbish, I don't know, but at least now's the time to explore it. That's a wonderful sentence at the very end. Uh, it is time and you are, you are the person to, to go ahead on that. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much.